Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have a legend of fitness. Tony Horton is the master behind the best-selling fitness program, P90X. They've helped millions get fit. They've sold a whopping over 500 million in sales of the fitness programs that include P90X, Power 90, one-on-one with Tony Horton, and the newest one, check out P90X3, which is a 30-minute workout. He's personally trained a list of clients that include celebrities such as Billy Idol, Tom Petty, Bruce Springsteen, many more, and developed workout plans for television programs like The Dr. Oz Show. Check out his book, The Big Picture, 11 Laws That Will Change Your Life. Tony, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, great to be here, my brother. Now, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, mistakes in your journey, what worked, what didn't work, um, I always like to include a fun fact, which is hard with you because you've done so many interviews that people know everything. And the fun fact you were telling me is you did something to, to survive. Will you tell people about that? Well, you know, when I first moved to Los Angeles from Connecticut, um, I didn't have much of a skill set. You know, I came out to California on a vacation and I realized, oh, wow, I don't have mom and dad anymore and I've run out of money. And so I survived doing different things. You know, carpentry was one. I was waiting tables, washing dishes, that kind of thing. But when I was back in Rhode Island, uh, I had two years of mime, pantomime training. And because I was a bit shy, but I also wanted to entertain people, mime was the perfect uh, uh, outlet for me because I didn't have to talk, (laughs) right? And so, but I got to be able to move physically. And I did the walk in the wind in the in the box, and the, you know I'd blow up a fake bubble and try to get my way out of it, and you know all kinds of things. I do the whole climb the ladder, uh, tug of war kind of thing. And when I was flat broke on several occasions, I would have to you know throw on the mime makeup and go down to either the Hermosa Pier or Santa Monica Pier. Or sometimes I go into Westwood near UCLA, and I'd put that hat down and I would you know try to make enough money so I could eat for the next couple of days. And typically. Oh. I, was, I would survive on, on yogurt and Cheerios. That was sort of my meal of choice. But those are brutal times. You know, it's very different to, to perform uh, for the fun of it, for the joy of it. You know, when you're, you're doing a show and, and people come to see you, that's a completely different energy than one that involves you having to go down to a pier at, you know, for about four or five hours, put a hat in the ground and perform for the sole purpose of surviving. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's a different energy altogether, especially if you're out there and you're not making any money and you're starving to death and people are, you know, stealing your hat filled with, you know, 30, 35 cents in there. Yeah, it was pretty brutal back in the day, but it's a great lesson learned. And so if you really kind of want to go to the next level, in my opinion, you've got to have those kinds of experiences. And I had that particular experience dozens of times. That's a really tough, especially if you're trying to feed yourself. What strategies worked when you were mine to actually get money from people? Well, I mean, the same strategies that I use now when I'm, when I'm doing one of my programs. I mean, humor is certainly part of it. You know, I mean, being very animated and being very silly and having a lot of fun. I, I wasn't the kind of mime that would make fun of people. You know, a lot of mimes would see somebody who was walking funny or had a funny face and they would kind of do that. You know, mime was a very, very physical performance. You know, I mean, I was, you know, when I did a, uh, a glass box or something, um, you know, there's a lot of physical movement there. You know, when I'm pounding, pounding the glass, you know, and really working you know to try to make my way oh wait a minute i'm in one now hold on let me lift up the window stick my head through you know i mean it was a i would be soaking wet soaking sopping wet you know because it's in a way it's it's a form of uh of of using two types of movements you know isometrics are certainly part of mine like you know i could keep my hand here in one place to make it feel like there's a there's a glass there but there's a whole lot of other things that have to go on I've got to keep tension here in my hand but there's things happening with my shoulder and my core and at that time I didn't you know all I knew was that I was working my butt off and I was sweating at the end and uh, if I ended up with 35 bucks I was thrilled so you're from the East Coast what brought you to uh, California Uh, I came out to California 1980 for a summer vacation I was supposed to move to Boston after four years uh, at the University of Rhode Island and to wait tables and with the hope that I, there was a modeling agency in Boston that I thought maybe I would work with occasionally, you know, but, but uh, I didn't know Boston very well. I had $400 in my pocket and my friend from high school, Bob Hennessy, called me up. He changed my life. He said, you want to come to Orange County and hang out with me for three months with the, with the possibility of staying there. And so, yeah, that sounded cool. You know, and I, I, I didn't even get, I got to Colorado Springs. No, I got to, um, 
I think I got to Colorado Springs and ran out of money and had to break out the mime and, and earn Really? Like What's amazing. Yeah. So uh, ran out of money at there or, or was it uh, somewhere else in Colorado? I can't quite think where it was, but, but um, Boulder, Boulder, Colorado. Oh, God, I'm glad I got that fact right. Uh, yeah. So in Boulder, I ran out of money, broke out the mime, did it, made about 125 bucks and had enough money for, you know, roadside campgrounds and gasoline and, and fast food before I got to Orange County. And after the four, three months were up, I, I fell in love with this place. I mean, it was just so, it was, it was the complete antithesis of what I had known on the East Coast. You know, there's a certain energy, a certain vibe, a certain way of thinking in New England, in New York, New Jersey. You know, it's just completely different than California. And um, uh, I think it's more homogenized now, east to west, because of the Internet and, you know, community. I mean, back in those days, you know, my mother would say, let's keep this call under a minute because it's going to cost you an arm and a leg, you know. <laughs> make doing mine for three hours at the pier so you had to be really careful back then uh and i just fell in love with it because there were opportunities here that just didn't exist for me on, on the east coast and uh i'm still on my 38 year vacation so how did you get into fitness then because i read also you did stand-up comedy too well yes i did and let me tell you how well that turned out for me well uh, yeah. it comes in handy in your videos though right Andy. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of improv comedy, a lot of sketch comedy, and I attempted stand-up, which is, you know, the bear, the bear of bears getting up there and being very raw with the hope that you're doing something that entertains people because it's, you know, it's so constant. It's, you know, you set up the joke, there's the punchline. Uh, well, it's just set up, act out, punchline, tag. That's like sort of the traditional uh, yoga. Uh, no, I'm sorry, yoga. Oh my God, I'm back into yoga. Uh, tra a traditional comedy sequence. And, you know, there's a list of three. There's all these, you know, it's a formula like anything else. And it was a great experience. I mean, being up on stage and being, you know, having that raw experience with an audience uh, certainly has helped me today, especially with interviews like this or, or in front of a live group of people, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 7,000 people. You know, I'm, I'm more comfortable in front of large groups of people on a camera than I am, you know, at a cocktail party. So do you still get nervous, like after doing it so many times? Do you ever get nervous or does it just come natural to you now? You know, very rarely. I think if I believe that the stakes are pretty high, you know, say, for example, I'm on a live morning news network show, you know, if I'm on Fox and Friends or Today Show or something like that. But, you know, it's funny. The last time I did rounds, I did a press, a press a tour uh, for X3 and the big picture. I thought to myself, no, I'm not nervous even doing this anymore, <laughs> you know, because I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. A degree that that I'm not, I, don't, I don't hesitate uh, and I don't, I'm not that attached to the outcome. It's, it's like I used to be. Yeah. I had these crazy expectations of how I would like it to go, and so it would sometimes um, adversely affect the moment. Yeah. And now I don't care about that so much anymore because I've got so many kind of fun things going on. That this is just one more experience in the course of my day, you know. Yeah. So the nerves don't exist. Really I was just wondering what people, like the audience, when they're thinking, well, they get nervous. So one thing they could do is just detach from the outcome, and, and then the kind of nervousness kind of goes away. It's just that, you know, being okay with, uh, with what's happening right then and there and, and not being attached to what you hope will, will happen. And, and knowing your material when you sit down and talk to somebody is kind of important to you. Yeah. So when did you get into fitness? Well, you know, um, it happened, I think, within the first year of being out here. Growing up on the East Coast, typically, you, there weren't gyms on every corner like there were in Southern California. You know, you found a gym at the high school or university. And they were athletes and non-athletes. And usually it was the athletes that were in the gym. Everybody else was just skinny because, you know, there was no health care crisis back then. But people didn't, you know, jogging was sort of a, a phenomenon happening in the 70s. You know, people were jogging. Like that was the first. There were no aerobics classes. There were no uh, step classes. There was no mixed martial arts. None of that stuff existed. You know, there were people who went to the gym uh, because they were an athlete and everybody else. But out in California, it was interesting because it was the first time I had experienced um, uh, joining a gym just for social purposes for, you know, sh you know, because, it, you know, obviously out here in California, uh, a lot of people are pretty hung up about the way they look. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why, and, you know, I took step classes and aerobics classes and I was on these various machines in this gym. I, I, I had never experienced before because back in the sixties and seventies, when I grew up, it was mostly barbells, dumbbells, uh, Nautilus machines were just being introduced. Uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, this brand new silly machine that was like, you could only work one, work one body part at a time. 
Um, and so I just did it purely because I was new to the area and I thought it was a great way to meet people as opposed to going to a club or going to a bar, which I still did too. But I thought, you know, why, why not add to the, you know, another, another way of meeting people. And I really, I really enjoyed not only how it changed me aesthetically, but also how it made me feel. You know, I, I had more energy. I had more enthusiasm for life. Um, I wasn't really quite uh, tweaking my diet just yet back in those days because I was broke. So I was living off of pizza, burgers, hot dogs, whatever I could get, you know, Taco Bell, whatever I could get a hold of. Uh, but I was young, my metabolism was pretty good, and I was pretty active playing, you know, football on the weekends and basketball, sandlot, you know, pick up basketball, and also going to the gym four or five times a week. So diet really wasn't a, was an equation because I was so young. I figured that out later in life. And, Do you and, think that gives you an edge because you were in that place, and when you're talking to a huge audience, and you can kind of relate to maybe where they're at in their budget or what they're eating, you know, with, and what you're describing your workouts? Well, you know, that's a great question because, you know, everybody's in a different place. You know, I mean, I don't know, it, it could be as, as, as odd as barometric pressure or altitude or, you know, economic situation or, or family issues or a lack of athleticism or lack of coordination or uh, lack of access, you know, uh, are just the opposite of all those things. You know, some people have, have the access, they have the time, they have the money, they have no excuses, you know. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if there's a if there's gravity where you are, and there's a surface of the earth that you can move on, um, and there's a willingness to, learn, to 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 educate yourself, well, then yeah, there's you can you can everybody can do push ups, sit ups, you know, some kind of some form of cardio and some sort of uh, leg or or uh, you know plyometric routine, and uh, it's just about you know deciding whether you want to figure that out and spend the time doing it, and it doesn't have to be an hour. No, it can be you know I mean I've created a program called Ten Minute Trainer. For people who, you know, we say don't have the time to exercise. But in reality, a lot of people just don't like being physically uncomfortable. And right. so if, if you don't like being physically uncomfortable for an hour, I get it. For a half an hour, I get it. But for, if you don't understand the importance of moving it for at least 10 minutes or 20 minutes a day, then you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're going to suffer from a level of discomfort and sadness that you don't need to, um, as opposed to somebody who makes those those positive choices in their life, who, who has a much, much more positive outcome. I mean, moving physically and eating well creates for a completely different uh, person. Uh-oh, I lost you. I'm here. You see me? Show yeah, me. I can see you. Can you see me? You know, I can't see you anymore. All I have is a... Did you check it? No. There you are. You're back, brother. Uh, <laughs> so, the, with the fitness... Um, when did you start getting traction results in your um, training business? Well, you know, when I first started exercising, I was doing it for the sole purpose of, you know, like I said earlier, you know, for more social uh, interaction with people. Yeah. And uh, I was an actor at that time. And, you know, when, you, when you're in Hollywood and you're looking for a couple of things, man, you're looking for that agent, right? And you're going through that whole getting your headshots taking care of, you know, trying to get in the union. There's a catch-22 about trying to get in the in Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA. And, and, you know, you can't get your Screen, Actor, Screen Actors Guild card unless you've worked. I mean, you can't work unless you've got a Screen Actors Guild card. You know, it's the ultimate catch-22. Yeah. So you're doing a lot of these non-union gigs with the hope that an agent will see them, like you, sign you, get you to a union gig, and there's something called Taft-Hartley. The reason why I'm saying all this is there's a reason for it. But but, you know, the main problem for me was that I wasn't getting the work I wanted to get uh, because my, the agents that I was talking to was saying, look, dude, you, you, don't, you don't look like a typical Californian. You're a little pudgy around the waist. Your arms are a little bit skinny. You know, you're a fairly decent looking human being. If you want, if you, you want to create another edge and that you want to be physically fit because a lot of the things they wanted to send me out on, you know, a lot of these auditions required somebody who looked a little fitter than I was. And so that was the ultimate motivator for me. And... Um, and uh, and then you know uh, I started training for that sole purpose early on um, to meet people, but also to get to make some money. You know, so I wasn't broke. I didn't have to. I didn't. I got tired of washing dishes, dishes and doing lime at the pier. So I just thought this was another avenue. But in the process of doing that, I was uh, one of my many jobs was I was a PA over at 20th Century Fox, a production assistant, and I was working for this guy Harlan Goodman. And you know, Harlan is pretty stressful life trying to make a movie. And he saw that I was changing, and I started training my own boss three days a week in the morning. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. He just said, hey, make me look like you, <laughs> <laughs> based on the little I know. 
I'm, I'm doing cardio certain days, certain hours, certain, you know, uh, at certain times of the day. And I'm also lifting weights and doing basic resistance pull-ups and, sit, and sit-ups and crunches and squats and lunges. And I got the guy in phenomenal shape. You know, I mean, he went from doing nothing to eating better and exercising. I mean, it's, it works for everybody. And then he introduced me to Tom Petty. And, and, you know, I mean, I was training up some people in my building and him and maybe a secretary over the 20th century lot. But I wouldn't call it a fitness business. It was just a guy making a few bucks on the side while also waiting tables, doing mime and running around, you know, delivering scripts. Um, and then when I started training Tom Petty, everything changed for me, you know, because I thought in that moment, it's time to get serious here. This guy is a big star and I want to make sure I don't hurt him. And I want to make sure that you know, there's a lot of people looking in, you know, checking me out. You know, who is this guy, Tony Horton? What are his credentials? Is he even certified, you know? And so it was one of those, you know, things where he, uh, Tom and I got along and, and he trusted me. And I got him in the best shape of his life and he went off on tour four months later and nobody recognized him. I mean, there's Tom Petty with, with tank tops on, you know, completely ripped. Really? It's three hour sets. And people going, is that Tom Petty or Bruce Springsteen? What the hell's going on? His band was even saying, holy crap, man, this, this guy's got more energy than he, than he had when we were first starting out. And at that point, you know, within that community, the word got out. And so at one point, I think you mentioned some of the people that I was training. On, on an average Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it was Tom Petty, Billy Idol, Annie Lennox, Stephen Stills, Bruce Springsteen. I had those five people in a row. That's Someone pretty sweet. Rocker, to rocker, to rocker, to rocker. And then, you know, I mean... It, Within a, the course of a year, I was up at 5 o'clock and I was coming home at 9.30 at night just training anybody and everybody who, who thought I knew what I was doing. And even at that point, I still wasn't certified. But what I had was a curiosity about, about different types of training, yeah. whether it be Pilates, yoga, or intervals, or, or, or core, or resistance exercises. And I brought that variety to the clients because it, it prevented boredom, injuries, and plateaus, right. which are the three things that kept people from exercising. So that's really how it shifted from guy at the pier doing mine to building a fitness fitness business. Now that's one thing you incorporate in your programs is just a variety of things. When did you hit a, like a tipping point or turning point for in terms of your fitness mind to do that? Because not everyone, obviously that is, not everyone thinks like that. They just kind of do the same thing over and over a lot of times. When did that click in your head to do that? Well, I have a form of ADD OCD okay. that keeps me, you know, I think curious. Um, I think a lot of people feel like they need to stick with what brung them, you know? And so whether that's Pilates or yoga or bodybuilding or whatever, they end up just doing this same myopic stuff because it did change them initially. Um, but they're not sometimes aware, and I talk about this a lot in my book, The Big Picture, <clears throat> is understanding when it changes and understanding that variety is a spice of fitness. Mm -hmm. And understanding that if you, if you start working on your weaknesses – as much as your strengths, or you start working on on, on on any kind of fitness that's brand new to you, then it's going to enhance already enhance the things that you're pretty good at. So when you had when if you're a bodybuilder and you had yoga, you're going to be a better bodybuilder. If you're if you're you typically somebody who just likes Pilates and yoga, and you start adding uh, resistance exercises, you're going to be better at Pilates and yoga. I mean, it's it's like a rocket science, isn't you know? It's, it's not rocket science. Is what I'm basically saying. Yeah. Always uh, continue to grow and get better. And not be bored and not get injured, typically, if you're smart with your with form and function when it comes to exercise. So you're working with a lot of celebrities. What's the next milestone that you, you hit with your business? Well, you know, whether it be a celebrity or an executive or a mom of five, you, you know, uh, uh, that business had a ceiling. You know, because there's only so many hours in a day. And I try early on to try to recruit other people, you know, in case I was traveling or I didn't have enough hours. And I, I just didn't want to build that business. Because yeah. you're just, already working 5.30 in the morning till 10 at night, so you can only add a few more hours there. You know, and I was getting 20% of what the other trainers that I hired, but then my clients would always say, I want you, I don't want so-and-so. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they're good, but they don't have your sense of humor, they don't have your, your style and your techniques and your sense of humor or whatever I would say that. But, um, so... You know, I thought to myself, wow, I'm not going to, I'm still going to live in this three bedroom apartment with a view of a convalescent home with a broken down car. Um, uh, I'm not having to do the other types of things that I was doing prior anymore, but, but I need to go to kind of the next level. So uh, I was still working, trying to work as an actor. I was still going out on commercial auditions and a couple of theatrical auditions. I, I got a couple of mo movies here and there, small, tiny parts that if you blinked, you wouldn't even know I was in the movie. But, you know, I was pursuing two careers at once. 
with the hope that, you know, maybe in the fitness industry, I could become a spokesperson. Uh, or maybe within the, you know, as an actor, I could get a TV series or become a regular commercial actor. I didn't really know, you know, I didn't really understand that these two, these two careers were going to come together and create what, what, what we've got now. And um, so I just got very fortunate because a, a friend of mine worked for Nordic Track. He was out of Minneapolis. And he said, you know, I think you'd be the perfect sports, spokesperson for some of the uh, Nordic, um, Nordic Track line of fitness equipment. So I went up to uh, Minneapolis and I did a little audition and I liked it and I, you know, I worked for them for a couple of years. And so now I had that spokesperson uh, background in conjunction with uh, the trainer so I could walk and chew gum, you know, because typically they would try to hire a trainer person who couldn't read a teleprompter. Or was yeah, so what were some of the skills you learned at that that were helpful? Very much so. You know, but a lot of it is serendipitous. You, you know, it wasn't like I said, okay, I'm going to do this, and in the course of six months, I'm going to reach this goal. You know, I went from somebody who said no quite often because I didn't have the self, the self esteem or confidence or, or wherewithal to be able to do some of the things that I was invited to do. And I had a couple of bad experiences because I showed up unprepared for a voiceover job or for a, for a spokesperson job where I just wasn't up to snuff. And so, you know, that's why I continue to work on my acting career and work, working on my vo voiceover stuff so that I could better represent a particular product if that opportunity came along again. And so, you know, with Nordic Trek, it was the perfect experience for me, you know, because you have to start, start here, walk over here, talk about, talk about the piece of equipment. Some of the, some of the stuff that you have to say is on a t teleprompter, sometimes it's not. And so just your brain is going at the same time while you're trying to stay relaxed and, and look confident. Right. And it wasn't easy going at first, you know, it was really hard. But I, but I put myself in these positions. I exposed myself to, to situations that were scary and hard. And then, you know, like anything else, it's about, it's about mileage. You know, it's about doing enough of something so that you become pretty confident, pretty good mm -hmm. at it. And then, you know, at that point, I was acting and I was training. And I had this pretty good life. And I had, a, I had two broken down cars instead of one. And I was able to sort of pay my bills and, and work on getting out of debt and go on the occasional ski trip and living in the same apartment for 21 years, but it was a nice three-bedroom rent control apartment in Santa Monica, so, you know, not so terrible. Uh, but then, then I, I was in the right place at the right time when I met Carl Deichler. Carl Deichler is the CEO of Beachbody, and it was a non-existent company in 1999. So how did which, you meet him? Uh, a mutual friend of mine said, you've got to meet this guy. You have the same sense of humor. You both like to train. You both, you know, like to laugh. And that's what it was. You know, we just got along. You know, he loved my training techniques. I went off to Canada about three months after I met him, and I set him up with a program, a program that was very similar to what I set Tom Petty up with or Bruce Springsteen, you know, which was sort of a six-day-a-week program rotating between cardiovascular exercises, high heart rate, lung and leg stuff, and resistance training, and just kind of going back and forth. And I came back three months later, actually four or five months later after that film, and I looked at him. I didn't recognize him, and I said, wow, man, you look, you look insane. What happened to you? She said, I did that thing you gave me. And I said, wow, you stuck with it. He said, yeah, I really believed in who you are, what you did, and, and I've never looked this good and felt this good. And at that point in his career, he was looking to do his next fitness program. And so we created something called Great Body Guaranteed. He paid me like a flat rate of 2000 bucks, which for me at that time was you know, good money. A couple, couple thousand dollars was great money. And we put it out there on these wild spots, these regional spots, you know, like Tampa, Florida, Seattle, uh, you know, maybe Poughkeepsie, New York, and we rolled the dice. And every time we spent some money on media, it made money, and it kept growing and growing and growing. Investors saw what what Carl had done, and at that point, I thought, oh, all right, I'm on TV. Yeah, that's cool. Finally, and then you know, we did Power 90, which was really the, the program before P90X. Mm -hmm. That thing, you know, the first year tanked because people would look at it and think, six days of exercise, I got to eat really well three times a day. Nah, where's the magic chair that makes right? Work? Three days, you know, uh, but there was a very, a, a very substantial percentage that did buy it and loved it and began to, and began to submit their before and after pictures and their videos. And we would get this material and we would look at it and think, oh my God, this this thing is really working. I mean, it worked with our test group, but you know, most test groups, it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty. Uh, there's a lot of rules. They're you know, pretty they're fit. Pretty well, they were fit, but you know, there are a lot of contingencies for them to stay part of the of the test group. You got to. You got to show up to the workouts, and we've got, you've got to eat the food we tell you to eat. And not everybody did that, but the few, you know, maybe the eight or nine people who did, made up that first infomercial, which, like I said, you know, it was just barely hanging on. And then we got these before and after pictures from real people, and we got real video from real people, and we we injected that into the infomercial, 
and, and Power 90 exploded. It really it built the company, and, and I, I was able to move out of my three-bedroom rent control apartment at that point. So tell me, I, I think it's interesting because what things in Power 90, because you have this test group, and what did you find out from the test group that you ended up really working in Power 90 that you wouldn't have known otherwise? Because I think this applies to any business. You know, We don't test enough things to know what to actually put into the product. We just kind of do what we think is right without going through that test group. You know, I, I had known at that point, especially after having gotten Billy Idol and Tom Petty and, and Annie Lennox and others in, in pretty good shape. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, here's the crazy thing. Everything works if you're willing to show up and do it. I mean, every diet out there works if you're willing to restrict your calories and, and eat better quality foods. But how do you sustain that? How do you maintain that? Yeah. You know, the variables, you know, what forms of, of accountability are in place? What is your plan? What is your purpose? And if those things are lined up, then you'll be successful. I don't care if it's with me or somebody else or CrossFit or, <clears throat> or you know, uh, gymnastic training or, or mountain biking, whatever it is. You've got to kind of be enthusiastic about what it is that you want to do. And everybody has a different, a different reason why. Um, so I had known prior to creating Power 90, what was, and it was, it's a simple formula. Number one, it's got to be consistency. You're not going to get results two, three times a week because, you know, two days on means five days off. And the five days are always going to beat out the two. I don't care how hard you're working on those two days. Even on, even with three days on and four days off, or four days on and three days off, four days on, it's just a, still a struggle. But you know, it's like everything else. You're going to have better success with your teeth overall if you brush them and floss them on a regular basis. Right, right. You're sleeping eight hours every night. You're gonna you're gonna have low cortisol levels. Your growth hormone is going to go up, and you're going to have more energy and enthusiasm to go about your day and add training and and keep your cravings at, at a minimum. You know, there's certain rules to life. You know what I mean? You gotta begin to figure those out. And I had already known what those were when I created the Power 90 test group. So I put Carl, our CEO, and John Congdon, our president, they were my guinea pigs for the first time. I mean, it changed and morphed. We took moves out, we put new moves in, we, 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 we messed with, you know, sequencing um, over and over and over again. And so they went through, the, you know, the rigors the first time around. And even after we went through the test group the first time, we thought, oh, you know what? We have to add more, more pull exercises. We need to add an extra 10 minutes of, of cardiovascular exercise training here. You know, so it really was a, a, a real test phase. But by the time we actually got it to video for people to buy, and I'm talking video back in those days because you know, nobody had DVDs yet. They had their half-inch tapes, you know, ka -ka -poom, you know right? things like Buick in their living room underneath their TV set. But at that point... You know, we knew what the formula was. We knew how long the, the cardio moves rut routine should be. We knew what kind of, what the sequences of uh, resistance exercises were. We wanted to introduce yoga to a program that was, you know, that programs like that hadn't seen that before, because I thought that was really important. And uh, and it was just, it was really amazing, you know, to go from total obscurity to having something that was on the air 24/7. Uh, and then meeting people that were doing the program at airports or the grocery store or walking on the sidewalk, you know, people would see me and it was the most bizarre sensation for me thinking, holy crap, this person recognizes me? What did I, did I owe money back in, you know, back in 75? What happened? <laughs> they would tell me their whole story because they're seeing me every single day for 90 days and more. And uh, it was just a really, really fun shift in my life. It was really cool to, to have that experience and meet people like that. And here we are, you know, it was 99, and here we are 2014, still doing it and still having pretty good success with programs, like you said, with one-on-one, -on -one, P90X, X2, X3, um, you know, uh, um, P90X Plus, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, now, it sounds like an upward trajectory, but I know there were blips on the, on the screen. What were some of the, the obstacles or challenges you had to overcome? Well, you know, it's like any it's like any band, any rock and roll band out there that comes out with that that pre, that, that that premier album, you know, and it, and it just blows up, and then you can't figure out why two albums later the band is broken up and they're not around and they can't make any music anymore. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to top yourself. I gotta I gotta say, and so you have to be willing. At least I have have to be willing to uh, walk your own talk. You know, I mean, put myself in situations. Uh, with other types of physical activity that I'm not very good at. For example, P90X3 has the Pilates routine in it, and Pilates, I, I, was, I, I, didn't, I thought Pilates was silly, much like I thought yoga was silly 12, 15 years earlier, 
And again, I was wrong. You know what I mean? So I've, I've, finally at my age, at 55, I've stopped judging uh, fitness programs that I'm unfamiliar with. It's just stupid. I mean, I, I just jump in feet first. I mean, right now I'm taking uh, hustle classes with my girlfriend, Shauna. And uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 meaning I'm awesome, and a 1 meaning I'm the worst person in class, I'm a negative 40, okay? That's, you would think that everything that I've done, train pantomime, I can do handstand push-ups, I can do backflips on a trampoline, I can't shift my weight from right to left and turn and twist and hold my girl without kicking her in the, stepping on her foot and and getting dizzy while doing it, you know. So uh, finally I'm at that stage of life where I understand the importance of always educating myself and, and becoming more familiar with mixed martial arts, with Pilates, with yoga, with core and functional fitness. And if you look at P90X2, for example, it's so different than, than P90X, you can't believe it. And it's very hard. P90X2 is an advanced program that takes you from that P90X fitness into the next level. And a lot of people who buy P90X2 don't want to go there. They're very disappointed because you're doing push-ups on four medicine balls. You're doing a move called impossibles. And I named them that because for the first two months, one rep is impossible. And so people just think, well, if I can't physically do the move, then why am I even bothering with this thing? And so the whole idea here is you're not, you're not doing this program. You're not, it's not like P90X where you're trying to change your body and lose a bunch of weight and get more fit. Now you're trying to take that fit body and learn something. You're learning a skill. You're learning to be better. You're learning to be athletic. You're working on your proprioceptors and that connective tissue, which makes you a better athlete. So, yeah, you know what I mean? I mean, if you look at any athlete, they've all gone through that, that process, you know, and so now I'm teaching you how to do that process. So if there was a blip in the sequence of success, I would say the P90X2, unfortunately, was not a product that a lot of people gravitated to because it was too hard. And that's why we changed with P90X3. We said, okay, let's get back to the basics of P90X. Create routines that are still hard, still effective, but in general, pretty doable for most people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, let's cut that time frame in half, that workout time frame in half, so that, that we kind of kill that excuse of not making time. And so I think as unbelievably successful as P90X was, X3 um, might not be there yet, but it's still early. It's too early to say. But our success rate is five times. Yeah. What P90X because people are finishing it. Right. When you hear 30 minutes, you're like, okay, this is doable. I can do 30 minutes. You just hate exercise. <laughs> you know, you just you just can't, you know, if you can't swallow that half an hour, uh, you know, Shauna, for example, P90X was just too daunting, too, too hard, too long, too much time in the gym. And I understand that. You know, I mean, she's pretty busy. She works for me, so I keep her pretty busy. But X3, she just finished it. Boom. I think she missed a day. But that one day she missed, she went to a Pilates class. So, she really didn't miss any days. And so she's fired up to start her second round because she can get her mind around that 30 minutes. And so, that, you know, that's why over the course of, uh, of, of this time, you, you got to understand what the public wants. You got to understand what they need. Yeah. And you have to understand that it changes all the time. So what, what worked really well to get it out there? I know you obviously had infomercials. Were there certain components within the infomercial that you felt worked really well? And what else? Like for someone who's like, I don't have the budget for an infomercial, what else can they do to get their product or service out there? Well, you know, you gotta, you, there's a couple things you have to have. You have to have a website. If you're in my industry and you don't have a website, well then, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, it must be 1965. Sell a really slick website that tells everybody who you are and why you're so cool. Second, get yourself a YouTube channel. And if you have an iPhone, you've got a YouTube channel. You know what I mean? It's not that hard to set it up. And so you want to do three to five minute little sequences about why you're awesome. You know what I mean? I don't care if it's physical or, or it's purely text or you want to blog, right? So you want to use social media and, and do you need, you know, do you need uh, Warner Brothers or NBC? No. no. The, the amazing thing about this, the way you and I are communicating is it gets information out there to a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't get it, you know? And so you need an electronic press kit. What is an electronic press kit? It's basically a really cool, you hit a link, boom, and this thing pops up, and it's got maybe five, six, seven pages of who you are, why you're cool, some great text, you know, uh, your mission statement, some great, maybe some video of some interviews that you've done, or interview, or, or just interviews you've, or, or, or just interviews you've done with yourself, you know what I mean, explaining who you are and why you want to help and inform people about being healthier and fitter. I don't care if it's even fitness, it can be finance, it can be relationships, it can be anything. You know what I mean? So those are sort of the basics. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, boom, use them. Use them as much as you can and try to build that fan base that way. And then 
Go ahead. I was going to say, so what did you do with the, because from the P90X worked really well, and what did you do with the, now the P90X3 because of what you learned that just launched P90X through the roof, or you already had that fan base, so it was easier? Well, I guess that proves because with the P90X2, it didn't do as well as you wanted. So what did you do with the P90X3 that you learned from the P90X? Well, we learned that that not everybody wants to be LeBron James, <laughs> You know, not everybody wants to do backflips on their with their skis. You know, I mean, that's the kind of program that P90X2 is. It really does mm-hmm. focus on being a better athlete. But uh, most people are too busy and, 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 you know, trying to get through their day-to-day. Um, and then all they're really trying to do is sort of sustain and maintain what they maybe achieved with P90X. But, uh, you know, I, I did a phone interview with somebody only a, a, about a week ago, and he had done P90X, P90X2, he had done P90X3. But his, his biggest issue was being able to link them together program after program after program. You know, without, you know, he would take two, a day, two days off and two months would go by and realize, oh, my God, I'm right back where I was. Yeah. Like, what was working so hard uh, for 90 days and then taking two months off and feeling like I have to start all over again? That's just a horrible feeling. That's, that feeling is worse than somebody who, who's clueless and has never exercised ever because there's nothing worse, it, 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 nothing worse than being at the mountain and being on top of that mountain. And then letting it all, you know, follow. It's, it, and then feeling like you have to start all over again. You know, if you look at me, I, I understand the importance of regular exercise and, and regular diet. And and the key, like I said earlier in our interview, is it's about being consistent, man. Not being attached to the outcome, showing up anyway, doing your best, and forgetting the rest. And that's why that's why we decided that P90X3 shouldn't be an extension of two. It should be. It should really be about getting back to basics, which is what P90X was. But eliminating the I don't have enough time excuse by making everything 30 minutes instead of about 55 minutes to an hour. Because um, the idea here is, is uh, to get people, uh, there's this little voice inside of your head that says, oh, my God, i got to do an hour. Right. I, Tony's funny. The results are happening. And I've done that for the last 72 days. And I'm going to fight for that day 90. But I tell you, man, when day 90 comes, comes around, for most people, it doesn't feel like day 91. It feels like day one all over again. Even though they're fit and they're strong and they've lost weight and they feel good, it still feels like, holy crap, I have to do this for 90 days again? <laughs> you just have to do it today. And when today's done, you figure out who you're going to do it with and what time you're going to do it, and then you're going to have day 92, 93. And then sometime, at some point, you're going to be at day you know, 10,016, 30 years from now. And that's the mindset. But people struggle with that hour long concept and we know it works. So what do we have to do with P90X3? We had to, we had to sh- shut me up a little bit, a little less talking from Tony and making sure that the sequences of the exercises were such that you could have very little downtime between each one. So typically P90X had 20 to 24 exercises per workout. How do we make the most out of 16 to 18 exercises per workout? Well, the sequence has got to be so that you can you can go from body part to body part to body part to body part. If you look at the, if you look at the challenge in P90X3, it's pull-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, push-ups. But at the same time, we're not telling you to do, you got to do 12 of this and 25 of that. We tell you that you get to pick the number so that you can stay with the pace of the routine. Aha. And then over the course of time, because practice makes for more athletic people, you're, you're, maybe you're starting out with, five pull-ups and 15 push-ups just just because you're doing it on a rate you're doing it more often and you're doing the other things that are going to help that improve that those numbers are going to go up inevitably they have to go up yeah. well, you have to show up and the numbers go up and oh by the way your fat percentage goes down your muscle mass increases uh your brain function is better you sleep better your sex drive improves you have more energy you have more you have a greater desire to kind of explore outside of the you know indoor training get in the outside world and that's the whole thing about it that's what the whole thing is about it's about taking these basic movements that you do in front of your TV so you can go out in the world and have some fun. So what's, you know, you ask people their big why to motivate them to work out. At this point, what's your big why that just keeps you going? Because you could probably go sit on a beach somewhere if you wanted to, but you keep producing and keep moving. What's your, what kind of motivates you to keep going? Well, you know, in this interview with this guy the other day, you know, it, it was really about, you know, how do I stay motivated? And it was about accountability, motivation, and inspiration. You know, those are sort of typically the things that people struggle with. 
And I asked him right out of the box. I said, do you work out alone or do you work out with somebody else? He says, I've always worked out alone. I said, well, there you go. That's part of your problem. You need to surround yourself with some really cool people who want to do fun stuff with you. Because you'll push them, they'll push you, and it creates that accountability because you don't want to, you don't want to disappoint them. You're going to disappoint, disappointing yourself is one thing. But typically most people show up more often if they've got some people to work out with. And so what inspires me is I love getting together with people who love to kick butt. You know, so I work out, I have workouts scheduled seven days a week. That doesn't mean I necessarily work out seven days a week, but I will work out 13 days in a row and go, I should take a day off. You know, I mean, I took yesterday off. I took Wednesday off. That's the second day I've taken off in 16. Yeah. I was going to ask you about law 11 of your book and if you actually abide by it. Recharge, recover, relax. Recharge by... I, I love sitting on my butt with my girl and watching, you know, episodes of Dexter. And, I mean, I do a, I, I do a probably a more TV time than most people would expect. That is my time to just chill. I mean, I love the news. I love politics. I love to educate myself about the world. I don't want to stick my head in the sand. I want to know what's going on. You know, so I watch shows like Vice and Frontline and 60 Minutes and the Nightly News. I just, I'm, it's it was super interesting to me. But it's also a chance for me to relax. I go to yoga every week. Yoga is a combination of yin and yang. It's not one or the other. It's, it's super restorative. It's great for balance. It's great for, for increasing flexibility and range of motion. But it's also strength. But there's a real super relaxing element to it. And, 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 uh, and one thing that I don't do that I wish I did more, which is really sit back and, and read. You know, just kind of, I mean, for example, I go on, I go on YouTube a lot. There's a great uh, Dr., Dr. Berg, who I don't know if you've ever interviewed, inter, uh, interviewed Dr. Berg. I'm no. not sure. Phenomenal guy, super bright, really, you know, knows about health and wellness and nutrition. And I just sat back for 20 minutes, and that was my form of relaxation. It's just sitting in a chair, you know, learning about glycogen and glucose and liver and pancreas and, and, uh, and horth gromo, uh, horth, horse, um, human, human horth gro oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you were just thinking of Shauna's Shauna's website, right? How that interacts with, you know, trying to get that and levels of cortisol. I mean, this is fascinating yeah. to me because, you know, it really comes down to, oh, yeah, I've got to eat seven cups of vegetables every day if I want to stay young and have tons of energy. And last but not least, you know, I, I, I'm I consistent and I maintain my, my exercise intensity uh, because it makes me happier than when I don't. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're, if you're looking at our interview, you have to decide whether you want to be happy or sad, and that's a choice. You know, it's a choice in more ways than one. But the but the potential to be more happy more often without having to get, you know, into your head too much about it is from physical movement, because physical movement changes your brain chemistry, and creating brain chemistry is what what allows you to make decisions every given moment. And the beautiful thing is that's happening every day. It could happen, you know, that could happen fifty times in the course of an hour. And so if you're exercising on a regular basis in conjunction with eating healthier foods, you're going to be happier than somebody who isn't. It's really that diff it's that clear, it's that simple, it's that universal. And, and so that's why I do it. It sounds like so, you know the big thing that inspires you is surrounding yourself with inspiring, motivated, unbelievable people. So who are the your favorite people and you can't say Shauna, who are your favorite people to work out with? And who are your favorite people to surround yourself with business-wise? Wow, that's a great question. You know, um, a lot of the people that you know from P90X are still people I train with. I still train with Bobby Stevenson from Chest and Back, Scotty Pfeiffer Scissors, you know, world-famous Scotty Pfeiffer Scissors. I still train with him. Um, and now there's a new group of young guys that I train with from, from, P9, from the original P90X3 test group. Oh. Uh, this guy, Victor, who's in, in P90X3, Kevin, and Ed. Now, Ed is, the, is really sort of the star. You know, uh, Kevin and Victor and Ed are really the stars of the brand new P90X3 infomercial because they're three overweight, overwhelmed, unhappy, miserable guys who exercised for a half an hour for 90 days who no longer, they're not those guys anymore. They're, they're confident, they're happy, they're fun, they're athletic. They've, they've completely changed their lives Physically, mentally, and emotionally, 180 degrees. So I'm thinking, I want to go hang out with them, you know, especially Kevin Mims. The guy's 23, you know. So here's this young, ambitious, young actor. You know, he's just sort of, you know, 23 years ago, he was an embryo, you know. And now he's just, <laughs> it's really cool. And they made this choice and they made this decision 
And so I want to hang out with those guys. I want to hang out with younger guys that are willing to push the envelope who used to be, you know, really overweight and miserable because they inspire me. You know, I mean, I go to, I go to yoga on, on Saturdays and, and I'm inspired by the guy who teaches the class. You know, Ish Moran is the guy who introduced me to, well, he's one of the first people to introduce me to yoga, but he's hit, if you look at the P90X original yoga workout, it's inspired by Ish. You know, I hang out with Ted McDonald. Ted McDonald has uh, created the, the, uh, the P90X2 yoga sequence. And he's a guy that I've traveled the world with. I've been to, I've been to Kosovo and Korea and Italy and Japan, and I've been around the world, you know, on on, on military tours with him and friends of mine, and, and these yoga retreats that we do together. You know, we were in, uh, we were in, in in Italy, which was ridiculous, and in Tuscany and Rome and Siena, and and it was because of this guy. You know what I mean? So my life is is much more interesting. It's expanded tenfold because I'm hanging out with people who want to see the world and kick ass and. And, and work out hard. And, and those are the people that I train with. Um, I know there was a second part to your question. Yeah, so the, the, I want to ask about the business, now the, who you like to hang out with from the business perspective. But I have to ask this. So if you had to choose one person that you want to train with or train, train in general right now that you haven't trained yet, famous or not famous, who would you want to train? Wow. That's your $64,000 question, Mike. <laughs> um, you know, there's people that I'm intrigued wa- intrigued by. Yeah. I think Elon Musk is certainly one of them. Who is it? Elon Musk. Oh yeah. You know, sex and, and Tesla. You know, yeah. he's the. And I, I know I, I have a friend of mine that works with him occasionally, and he says you just sit next to this guy for four hours and you can't believe how big his brain is. Um, you know, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's probably you know like somebody like Steve Nash. Steve Nash is I've always been a big fan of Steve Nash. I'd love to meet with him and train with him. Um, you know. Uh, uh, Blake Griffin is another guy I'm really impressed. Oh by. yeah, I'm sure he's a he's amazing. He, such a such a, a rock star. The, the Clippers struggled a little bit last night, but uh, that's all right. Hopefully they'll come back. You know, um, yeah. There's people like that. I, I'm working on a on a. Uh, I just did a pilot, uh, which I'm really excited about. And the pilot is TV pilot. You know, we're, we're going to actually go to some some. Uh, Can you say what the what it's called or? yet but I can say what it's about and it's really about meeting some of the people that I'm most impressed by not not only people who are great athletes but maybe maybe a, a first responder or or a, or a truly um, altruistic individual like Scott Pfeiffer you know Scott Pfeiffer's uh, uh, from P90X uh, has started the go campaign and, and Scott is making a huge difference yeah. for kids around the world, you know kids young orphans around the world just doing an interview with Scott and showing people hey look you don't. You don't have to be a miserable lawyer for a firm who's getting a snot beat them out, a beat out of them every day. You can. You can create a business yeah. that changes lives and end up being ten times more happy. That's really kind of Scott's story, you know. Yeah. And and there are a lot of stories like that. A lot of people out there like that. And that's what the series is about. Is sort of um, immersing myself uh, in these people's lives and hearing what their stories are and sort of showing to our audience. Look, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to be in that cubicle doing that job. You know, maybe there's a hobby out there that you really love. You know, focus on that hobby because that hobby could turn into one, your next business. A great short story is there was a guy who had just that lifestyle. You know, he was working for the man, pretty miserable, but he loved bikes. He loved mountain bikes and road bikes, and he would spend the entire Saturday at, at his local bike shop. You know, and then the, the manager of the bike shop said, geez, man, you're here every day. Why don't you just, you want to work for me on Saturdays? Because I need, I need a part-time help. Five years later, he, he owned the business. Wow. He's not the guy who's you know crunching numbers in a cubicle. He's the guy that owns the store, doing what he does. And so, you know, I talk about that a lot in my book, in the big picture, is that you know, look, do do what you love, do what you want, and you might not be able to make a living at that right away. And that's a beautiful thing. If you look at uh, Beachbody, has this the Beachbody coaching opportunity. I, I met two gals in New York City. One was a former a New York City employee. The other one was a teacher. And you know, they were overweight women in jobs that provided enough money to be able to feed their kids and assist with the bills, you know. And now they have fit clubs where 150 people show up on Saturdays and they have these coaching businesses where they're, you know, they're selling my products and other products that Beachbody makes and they're making six figures. Wow. <laughs> and they're both, one lost like 100 pounds, the other one lost 45 pounds and they're completely different human beings because they're doing what they love. And yeah. so that, I think that's really ultimately what it's all about. So who do you surround yourself from the besides the fitness aspect, the business aspect? Because you have, you know, books coming out, you know, P90X three, 
Um, you have Tony Horton's Kitchen. I've watched your videos on uh, making smoothies. Tell me, who do you surround yourself from a business perspective? Who are some of your mentors? Very lucky. And, and so, you know, when I met Carl Deichler and John Congdon at Beachbody in 1999, I didn't know who I was surrounding myself with. Was. I, I, you know, I was like a young actor who was just looking for a gig, looking for some money so I could pay my bills. And so when two total strangers, for the most part, say, hey, you're a cool guy, can I start training with you? Oh, by the way, your, your, your training techniques have changed me. Hey, do you want, you want $2,000 for a video? You know, it wasn't like I said, well, I'm going to pick you and I'm going to pick you and I'm going to pick you. No, I was just, you know, somebody asked me to do something. And I was at that stage in my career where I wasn't afraid not to try. Right. As I had been, and I just said yes. I said yes to two people who wanted to give me money to develop a program. Yeah. So, uh, you know, who knew the company was going to grow and be as, as massive as it is? I mean, it could have gone away, and it could I, I could be doing something else. You know, who knows? But so, you know, I, I make sure that while I'm working with that organization, and that's really the bulk of my my income. You know, let's face facts. Uh, that I try to do anything and everything I can. You know, and I try to be as creative as I can. I try to sh you know show up and be you know the best possible employee, I'm not really technically an employee, I'm sort of a hired gun, I'm a, I'm a consultant. But, you know, uh, we've had this kind of a success over this, these many years uh, because I really do care about the customer, I care about the company, I care about the ideas, I, I care about what direction we're going in. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit on my hands and, and, and assume that that's going to go on forever. There's a lot of people in my industry, and, you know, we can name them on two hands. People that were super famous all over TV were gone. Right. And gone because they just assumed that that, that wave is going to go on forever. Right. That's Tony Horton. I developed Tony Horton Kitchen because it's another way to sort of help people understand that it's important to eat really well. You know, it, it's, it's people don't know what that is. It's organic, fresh food delivered to your door. If you live in the continental United States, this is fresh food. It's not frozen, so it's triple sealed. You order it on one day, and it's at your, it's at your door forty-eight hours later. Wow. And you have the time, and we're also working with Seven Eleven to try to create that model at 7-Eleven because, you know, there's some, there's some really cool young executives at 7-Eleven right now who understand that you've got this massive international company that's selling hot dogs, Slurpees, and bagels. And mm. red. Good point. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, there, and a lot of them are in the middle of these food deserts all around the country, all around the world, and they, and they understand, you know, these young guns over there came to us and said, you make this great product and we want to be able to get it in your stores. And so we hope for a, for a late May, early June launch. We're very close. We're excited about Tony Horton Kitchen. Not only deliver to your door, and by the way, here comes that first plug of the interview, TonyHortonKitchen.com. Go check it out. You can do five days a week, seven. You can do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can do lunch and dinner only. Vegan, pescatarian, flexitarian, whatever you want to do, right? So there's that business outside of Beachbody. Yeah. And so I'm, I've surrounded myself with, with, with some great people at 7-Eleven and, and, uh, and two high school friends of mine that were, you know, kind of business guys that want to get into something different. And we're working together to try to do that. Do that. And then I'm trying to start my own clothing line. And we hope to have that out and about come uh, end of July and August. The samples for the men's stuff are in. It's, this stuff is so beautiful, so state-of-the-art. The material is so awesome. You know, I mean, we're so excited. So what is it? What is the material? Well, you know, if you look at, if you, it, it's, you know, it, it's high-end stuff. It's like a cross between a Ralph Lauren Sport and Under Armour or Nike, or, you know, that kind of quality. But there are different materials, you know, some that breathe. The weight is just right. It wicks really good. If You know, I mean, like, for example, it, it's material that, you know, if you've been in it for a couple hours, it doesn't, you don't smell like you've, you know, lived in a sewer for three days. <laughs> right. Those kinds of things matter. It's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do just T-shirts with my logo on it. I want, I, and, and, and women have been getting all the cool stuff. You know what I mean? Guys get t-shirts and sweatpants made of cotton. I mean, you know, there are some companies that are making nicer stuff. Like if you look at, at our, a company called Arcteryx or Mountain Hardware um, or North Face, they're getting away from um, the mountain climbing gear and the ski gear and beginning to make fitness wear. And they're making beautiful stuff out of beautiful, beautiful material. Uh, but I wanted to start there. I didn't want to make my way there. I wanted to start there. Mm -hmm. And those samples are coming in in the next couple of weeks. And that we seems like too, like such a different industry and a huge learning curve. What were some of the, yeah, what were some of the things that pitfalls you hit with though? I mean, food and then clothing seems like you have manufacturing all these difficulties. What were some of the uh, pitfalls that you wish you watched out for? Well, you know, these experiences building my own brands are not that dissimilar from what Carl and John was going you know what was happening to them when they were building Beachbody, mm -hmm. 
know, it's kind of a shot in the dark. You have this vision about something that you really believe in, and you only hope to God that you get in bed with the right people who have the same mindset that you have, yeah. the same ethic that you have, that have that are willing to kind of do deals where everybody benefits and not somebody's, you know, doing better than somebody else. You know, and so, you know, without getting into details, there were some major pitfalls with Tony Horton Kitchen early on. You know what I mean? Our our, our vendor uh, wasn't always the best and always on time and paying on time. It's and tough. Really hard, you know what I mean? But it doesn't mean you stop. Especially fresh food I would, and delivered quickly. That seems really difficult, actually. He already had a business where he was doing that. You know, he had a, he had a regular, that was, you know, our original vendor was somebody that did that for a living yeah. and saw that my, you know, the Tony Horton brand was pretty popular yeah. and so he said to us he came to us and said what would you want in these food meals what would you want it to look like what kind of food you know and so he already had his kitchen he already had that going on and so he already had the packaging yeah. he already had so partnering with someone who's doing it who's an expert is is key it would help that's how i did it i yeah. wouldn't say anybody. and you look at 7-eleven 7-eleven has 26 commissaries around the, around the country so you know they make it on a saturday night it's in the store on sunday morning right. that's but the idea here is, yeah, we're not making bagels and donuts in your commissary. Right. Sandwiches that have 1,500 ingredients in them. You know, do you have access to, to uh, you know, farm-raised farm chickens? Do you mm. have to whole grain breads? Do you have access to, you know, so they had to kind of, they had to do their due diligence in regards to finding mm. different vendors so that the food is more healthy. Yeah. I like that. Changing fitness and now changing food. And Tony, I want to get, um, before I bring on the special guest, I want to know what one of your favorite stories uh, is from the big picture, from the book. What, one of my favorite stories? Yeah. From you, know, you look at the chapter intensity. Yeah, I, I was, I was, when, I was in, uh, when I was in Korea, I was fortunate enough to get a ride on, a, on an F-16. And so, uh, uh-oh, Shauna doesn't like that story. I shouldn't tell that story. Oh, I'm, it was Japan. I'm getting my, yeah. Oh, sorry. she mentioned, I have that in my notes to ask about this because I asked her what questions I should ask and she said, mention the F-16. So um, go on. Well, you know, yeah, I was down in Japan and um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the guys on the base, the Air Force base, were all using P-90X. So uh, they found a certain intensity to that. So they thought I would love an F-16 flight. And, and it's a pretty long story, but a long story good. I, uh, it was a lot more intense than I even anticipated. You know, I threw up seven times. Oh, um, really? Yeah, oh, seven times easily. They told me not to eat too much, and they told me to eat a lot because the training process is almost eight hours. You've got to learn about the flight suit. You've got to get that thing on. You've got to get your, your breathing, you know, correct. You've got to go through a full physical. You've got to do your parachute test. You have to do your ejection seat test. There's all these things that you've got to go through during the course of the day. It's pretty, you know, you don't just hop in and go. You know, they want to prepare you in case there's an emergency or something. Right. And so, you know, breaking the sound barrier was, you know, going 900 miles an hour. But you don't really notice that because the boom happens behind you. But you just, you can see the the speedometer there. It's pretty cool. We broke 3Gs, 5Gs a couple times, and then 8.8Gs. 8 .8 We're trying to go 9Gs. And if you break 9Gs, you get a 9G pin. But but it was a cold, rainy day, so the, the jet just couldn't get up to 9. But it didn't matter because I, I you know, when you're doing... The scariest roller coaster in the world does about 1.6 Gs. Our first maneuver was three. Wow. So we're, we're doing almost twice what you'd ever see on a crazy roller coaster. So you're rolling, you're banking, you're going straight down, straight up. They gave me I'm the, getting nauseous hearing the story. <laughs> rolling like this. You know, I mean, one minute we're a, we're a bullet going into the ground. The next minute we're a, you know, a rocket ship going into space. And they let me fly it. You know, I mean, it's so funny. How really? I'm, and I'm, I'm making myself vomit. I mean, I was a wet rag when I came out of there. When the oh. canopy came up and the helmet came off, Shauna was there. My whole kind of my entourage on this on this fitness tour was there. There was a couple of generals and colonels and majors and about twenty people. And my when the canopy come, came off and my helmet came off, the the reaction, the look on people's face, you know, they were applauding. And then all of a sudden, they looked at me and went, "Oh, oh my god!" <laughs> I looked like a I looked like a Sharpay, uh, a seventy nine year old Sharpay. It was oh just my God. And Mark Briggs turned to Sean and said, well, now you know what he's going to look like when he's an old man. <laughs> I skin was white and melting off my face. It was, it was brutal, man. But it, may, it makes for one of the all-time craziest stories. Yeah. So everyone should check out the big picture. Before I bring the guest on, Tony, tell people where they can find you. What are some of the sites they should check out? Well, you know, you can always go to Beachbody.com, P90X3.com, mm -hmm. P90X.com. You know, if you're looking to buy... 
You can go to Shakeology.com, which is, you know, if you want to look into Shakeology. Those are simple ways. But if you really want to kind of get to me, um, you can go to TonyHortonsWorld.com. Um, but the new one is uh, Tony Horton Life. Pretty easy. TonyHortonLife.com. And then you can go to YouTube, uh, and that's Tony Horton Fitness. So you've got Tony Horton Fitness, Tony Horton's World, Tony Horton Life. Uh, so great ways. And the great thing about Tony Horton Life and Tony Horton's World you kind of know where I am and where I'm going and what I'm doing. There's a live event and you're in that neighborhood. Yeah. It's an easy, simple way to kind of find me and show up and be there. So I've got events in Michigan, Michigan coming up. I've got one in Bakersfield. And I've got one in Hawaii in September. Um, so uh, come to that one because I think that's the one I'm going to ask Shauna to marry me. So that'll be fun. I um, won't publish this till after then. So. I think she knows. I think, she, I think she's in on the on the... The jig is up on that one. But um, so, yeah, there's a lot of events like that. And, uh, and that's a great way to find me. I'm going to be in upstate New York at, at Omega, uh, which is a beautiful place. If you're, if you're anywhere, New York, New Jersey, you know, New England, Pennsylvania, Canada, you know, come see me at Omega. And that is at TonyHortonsWorld.com. It's a great three-day event. It's super intimate. It's out in the middle of these beautiful woods. The food is organic, super clean, yummy. You can slack line, throw frisbees, hang out in the grass, and, and uh, get your butt kicked by me for a couple of workouts. But you have to sign up early because that's going to sell out. I think they've got room for about 200 people, and they're and they're they're they got about 50 spots left. That's oh. in New York, and that's called uh, Omega. It will go quickly. I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring the guest on. So I have on my to dos right now to make sure to facilitate you training Elon Musk, Steve Nash, and Blake Griffin. So. Um, that's on my to do's. Uh, let me, <laughs> I'm going to bring the guest on one second. You know, one of the things that I write on my questionnaire is who are, who's on your bucket list? You didn't choose Oprah. You didn't choose a president, but you chose Tony Horton. So I wanted to have you and, and have on and uh, have your way and, uh, chat and ask your questions that you have. Tony, I appreciate you uh, indulging in this. Not a problem. Dustin, how so, are you? Dustin, tell them a little bit about you. And I know you have a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Tony, for uh, doing this, and I uh, definitely look up to you. Um, I've got a program, a, a movement I consider called Fit Moms for Life, and uh, kind of known as America's Trainer to the Moms. And with that, uh, I've uh, worked with about five thousand uh, clients in person, and then about fifteen to twenty thousand through my DVDs and various uh, various things. So. Um, really look up to you as an inspiration, not only from a, a business standpoint, but also from a fitness standpoint. I'm 30 now, and just what you've done to really inspire, you know, the world to to be healthier. And you know, so many of my clients have P90X and 10 Minute Trainer and all those, you know, great programs. So, uh, just really respect you a lot, and and super excited to to be on with you. So, what are your you had a few questions? I yeah. know Tony, you have what like four minutes, five minutes, right? So. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So yeah, my, my first question is kind of what is it like, you know, working with Beachbody, the pros and the cons to it? You know, do you have to sign your life away or do you have freedom to do other things? Well, well I love it. I mean, it's completely changed my life working with this company that's grown so far so fast. I mean, uh, it seems like, my, you know, when I look back at the last, I don't know, how many years, 16 years, um, a lot has a lot has happened, you know, and and I think the positive things are pretty obvious. You, know, you look at the products we've created together, and and without them, I would have never had that opportunity. Right. Without them, I wouldn't have these those other opportunities. I wouldn't be able, you know, nobody would know Tony Horton from Adam. So, uh, I wouldn't have these opportunities with Seven Eleven and and this clothing company, and uh, I wouldn't have been able to meet the folks at Harper Collins and written these books. And so, you know, it's just, it's not only improved my lifestyle and allowed me to have access uh, to, to really amazing experiences, but it's opened up other doors as well. And, and that's really been pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, I, I would say some of the cons are, you know, when you get to this point, you know, you feel like Paul McCartney and the Beatles. You want to kind of break up with the band and go on, on your own um, because, you know, there are certain restric restrictions within my contract, which are there to protect not only them, but protect me. But there's a lot of things that I can't do because, you know, I, I can't, you know, you can't play for the Green Bay Packers and, and uh, uh, you know, the New York Jets. you got to stick with one team, so you can't compete against yourself. Yep. So, you know, but the, but the great thing about Beachbody is they've opened up categories like food, like, like fashion, um, like book writing. And, uh, and so in the meantime, I do everything I can with them 
uh, and, and try to, you know, um, be able to you know, adhere to the restrictions of that contract and, and build these different products and still be able to go off on my own. And, and a certain res- in a certain way, it's probably good because there aren't enough hours in the day to be able to, you know, do a lot of the things that I've been offered lately. Right. Cool. So I've got two more questions. I know time is tight. So I'm obsessed with creating communities. That's what I believe is is how we're going to change the the future of our culture and that change the conversation we're having um, in our homes, schools, churches. And so I've created a lot of groups around the country. We've got about 105 Fit Mom for Life groups um, everywhere around North America right now. And our goal is to have 14,000, which is one for every McDonald's in America. That's kind of our, our three to five year plan. And we just find, you know, women in the community that are, are looking to, to start a group up. But so my question is kind of what do you think about that from a community standpoint? Do you think it is one of the most important things to kind of change the way our, our culture and America and the world is, is you know, living today? And, uh, and how are you planning on doing that? Obviously, Beachbody has their Beachbody coaches and different avenues. But I would just be curious to hear your opinion on that. I, I think you're right on track, Dustin. I, I think it's critical. You know, I think a lot of people are becoming de- so detached. Um, that it's becoming more and more difficult uh, for people to sort of maintain and sustain their health and wellness. Um, so I, I would say you're spot on, you know, trying to create as many communities. Uh, cre- creating communities creates accountability and it creates purpose. And, and when you've got a, a group of like-minded people in a room, you, you can really change the world. And I think you're, you're spot on. It's funny that you use the word fit mob. You know, I was, uh, I was in the early stages of uh, creating uh, an app called fit mob. I don't know if that's Fit, is fit moms or fit mob? Moms, fit moms. Fit yeah, moms. Okay. yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful. You know, it really is. It's a great idea. I think you found a, a beautiful niche, and it sounds to me you've had some great success. And so, uh, no, I would not deter you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I would not have you stray from that formula. I think creating those communities is great. It gets people away from the screen and their and their and their phones and their TVs and it gets them out and about you know I mean I, I try to do that with things as simple as getting together with some friends and doing these dance lessons which apparently I'm you know I'm gonna take I'm gonna try and get you on Dancing with the Stars I think that is your next gig <laughs> since way we can get, come close to that one I was asked a while back or there was early talk of it and after these few lessons I discovered that was a horrible idea so. and Tony we've got a lot of uh, mutual friends together someone like Joe Polish for example there's uh, I mean his, his group and a lot of different groups that we have a lot of uh, a lot of mutual mutual friends and people. So hopefully someday I'll get to meet you in person. So my last my last question for you is kind of you know with P90X and stuff we kind of rode this DVD wave. I've ridden it in a in a much smaller version than you did. And you know where do you see it going from here? Obviously technology, mobile, you know making things as convenient as possible, which I think is where things are going. And my my belief is, you know, with the communities and trying to pair both together to create experiences. But where do you kind of see, you know, Beachbody, yourself, your own brand going to really try to, again, change the conversations we're having? Because I still don't believe that there's this tipping point yet in our culture. You know, I see so much resistance with my clients. They're trying to eat healthier. They're trying to maybe drink less alcohol or whatever it may be. And they're getting such flack and crap from their friends. And it's still not cool nationally to to be fit and healthy and to say no to certain things. Well, you know, I think the future, I think it's changing. I think it's changing. Yep, very absolutely. And I think companies like ours, uh, I think Beachbody is in the midst of, of trying to make that shift. I mean, the idea of somebody seeing an infomercial and then having to get on the phone to call somebody who might be in India somewhere and, and, and negotiate what to pay and for how much and, and then pay extra money to have that shipped you know, at a sooner period of time and then waiting for the mailman to deliver it so that you can open up the box, take out the disc and put it in a machine so you have to, you know, the you know, first part. That is so archaic. Yeah. I mean, streaming now. So we're working on that and I, you know, I, I, I make that email at least four times a week. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up because we got to be part of the future. We don't want to get caught behind the eight ball. Right. You know, how do you, you know, the, the problem with Beachbody is we've got this coaching business and, you know, we have these challenge packs that the coaches, you know, try to promote to help build their businesses and share our, share our products with other people. If you're streaming a video, mm, how does the coach uh, manage to build their business and how not screw that up? And so yeah, yeah. it's a very, a very complicated equation, but we're working very hard on, on it. So, um, you know, and when it comes to training techniques, 
Uh, if you look at it now, you know, look how much yoga has changed. You walk into a yoga class these days, it doesn't even look like yoga anymore. And I don't think it's a bad thing. There's a lot of traditionalists that feel like, oh, you know, where's the traditional hatha, ashtanga, yin type yoga? They still exist, but you have to understand that, you know, people want to add cardio to yoga. You can call it something else, but I don't, I don't think it's kind of silly to get upset about those types of things, you know. Um, and, and same thing with resistance. I mean, you look at core and functional fitness, you look at the popularity of, of, of P90X and CrossFit. You know, the idea here is, is to be excited about what you're doing. Uh, be okay with the fact that things are going to change, and that's probably a good thing. And and hopefully you've got the right instruction and motivation, um, so that you're not getting hurt. You know, there's a lot of people who right. are pushing the envelope who shouldn't be. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's all good. It's going to change. It has to change. And if you're not moving, if you're not changing, if you're not reinventing yourself every once in a while, then you're going to get you're going to be stuck in the past. Yeah. yeah, I feel like really the the shift too is going to really come when it hurts people's pocketbooks more through insurance. And through work, you know, work compensation or whatever, I think that's really when some of that change is going to happen because people are going to feel, yeah, and, feel and in their pockets. You know, the thing is, is that sure there's going to be there's going to be pushback from members of your family and people at work and blah blah blah. People don't like to see you change. They're so used to seeing you a certain way, right. and they, it's really comfortable for them to fit you in a, in a very easy, understandable box. <clears throat> and you know, I mean, you have to have the courage to, you know. Tell them to f off. To be honest, you know, I mean, it, sorry to, you know, yeah, it's fine. But the, but you know, a great example is this girl Kathy. You know, she had tried everything. She's five foot three, two hundred twenty pounds, miserable. You know, taking a bus to work, no support from her husband. She bought P Power ninety, did it three times. Did P ninety X, did it three times. We put her in an infomercial. She lost hundred plus pounds. She couldn't do a single push up at the beginning, and could do ten pull ups the day I met her. Wow. And she got grief every step of the way from almost everybody in her life but somehow she knew deep inside of herself that it was the right thing to do because when she was done with that workout she felt better about herself yeah. and so feeling better about herself was enough of a signal to ignore all the all the chaff that was going on around her and I, I mean, that takes a lot of courage and so you know if, if you're listening to me then you have to find that you have to find the power uh, to stick with it and understand that feeling that you have at the end of the workout is Ten times more important, a thousand times more important than all the negativity that's coming at you from all your friends and coworkers. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Tony. I know you have to go. I appreciate your time, Dustin. Thank you very much. Thanks for making it happen, Steve Nash, Blake Griffin, Elon Musk. If you're listening, this man wants to train you. Dustin, <laughs> thanks for your hard work and what you're doing. You know, I can't do it alone, and it's great to have really smart, uh, thoughtful. Uh, enthusiastic people like yourself uh, in the community, man. So keep up the good work and, and pleasure chatting with you today. And Jeremy, same deal, man. I really enjoyed this uh, hour together, and and I know there's some great information here that could help you. Shout out to Shauna as well. Thank you, Shauna. You made this and, happen. And real quick, Tony. I just wanted to say that one of my my visions is to uh, to pack out uh, arenas for Fit Mom for Life rallies. And our first one, we want to have Michelle Obama on it. But uh, I want you on there too, uh, as well. So I'm just going to throw that out there in the future. First lady, I've met her a couple of times. You know, she's such a good, good person. Really looking to, you know, help people eat better and move on a regular basis. So, yeah, yeah, I'd be glad to do it, my man. All right, we'll be in touch. Thank Jeff, you. My contact info, so I'm in. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.